Tuesday, March 15th. This is the Village of New Paltz Planning Board, second meeting in March. Welcome, everybody. <coughs> uh, we have one public hearing on PB 1605 <coughs> for a site plan amendment at 59 Elting Avenue. Um, then we'll have a look at that after public comment. We have two new applications, uh, 58 Main Street, um, which we saw as a pre-application a couple months ago. And is back as a formal site plan. And we have a site plan amendment for PB 1607 at 58 Elting Avenue. Um, discussion about recreation fee policy and then uh, approval of minutes and April 5th meeting overview. Uh, anything else people need to add, change? Nope. All right, so a uh, motion to open the public hearing for PB 1605. So moved. Second. Second. Wait it out. Um, okay. Uh, John, you seconded. And no, Liz, Liz got it. Okay. Nice. She was faster than that. Right. Let's, let's try to avoid controversy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Anybody here to speak on the site plan amendment at PB 1605? Um, motion to close the public hearing. I'm moving hearing. to close the public hearing. So moved. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Mr. Robinson, so we've held your public hearing and seen your plans. Thank you for submitting the changes to the plan that show the sewer and mortar. Appreciate that. Um, so are there any dis things that the planning board wants to discuss about this? Um, this addition to the home at 59 Helting. No? Everybody good? Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a resolution for site plan amendment approval, 59 Elting Avenue. Planning board application PB 1605. <coughs> it just lays out the facts. And um, now, therefore, it is hereby resolved by the Village of New Paltz Planning Board that the application of Stuart Robinson for site plan amendment approval for construction of an, an additional room in the house by enclosing an existing back porch at 59 Elting Avenue as shown on the aforementioned plans dated 3216, amended the same day, Christina? Is that correct? Yes, sir. And amended on 3216 is hereby approved. The chair is authorized to sign the final amended site plan subject to payment of all fees and escrow and submission of a final site plan with a signature block suitable for signature by an authorized <coughs> representative of the planning board. Do we have that? Okay, great. That's the resolution. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Any more discussion? Uh, all in favor? All right. All right. Any opposed? Okay. So um, I don't think you have any outstanding fees at this point. Um, and I will go ahead and sign that this evening so you can come in tomorrow and get started with the building inspector. Okay. All right. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I skipped over public comment. I'm coming back to it. Sorry, dear. Uh, anybody here speak with public comment? So different from last night. Um, okay, hearing none, let's move on. Bobby, 58 Main Street, PB 1601. All right, so um, back in January, we saw this application, but at the time, Bobby was interested in just getting a temporary off, giving, getting, hoping to get temporary authorization from our building inspector to um, finish off the roof to avoid any problems with that area. And now the <coughs> application is to complete the building? Correct. <coughs> to enclose it 
Okay, uh, but no drainage, I understand, at this time. No, you know, I realize that that was a bigger issue because I do want to knock down that, that temp uh, well, the temporary shed that we put right. back. Um, and I realize that, that uh, well, I had the uh, engineer in there, and he pointed out to me that the grade there now mm -hmm. no longer goes that way, and that, that grade actually has to be changed. So right. I thought that it, it would be foolish to try to mix these two things and okay. have his engineer in that. I'd be, I'd be asking for something that I didn't even know what it's going to look like in the end. Okay. And it seems as if it could be a better. Just come, come again. And yeah, do let's it do it right that way. way. Okay. So, <coughs> tell us what it is that specifically now. So, uh, the, the two issues uh, that I'm trying to address. Now, one second. Sure. Christina, could you just hand those out? Yeah. It's all right. You don't have to fold them all up so that people can follow along. Thanks. Can we ask that we backtrack just a little bit to remind ourselves of the origin of the, of the issue that we're addressing with this too? Yeah, sure. Just brief, wait, it's very brief. Christina. Yeah, okay. So uh, most of this area that you see with the, that uh, I wanted to enclose used to be the original bottle shed and propane tank area. Um, with the village board, um, there was this decision. Uh, the village board was considering putting in the, uh, gas, the natural gas line extension. We had to remove that part of the of the property where the gas line would go. And um, in the end, the, the village board decided to put the gas line in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't make any jokes. Yeah. Um, uh, which is uh, which forced us at the time to build this temporary bottle shed on the right side of the 58 Main Street building. Um, and pr although that's really not good for a bar, um, it's not contiguous to the property. We can't get into it from the outside. Creates all sorts of problems. But probably we would have lived with it, except that uh, building that shed, that temporary uh, structure, changed the drainage there and started to undermine the building. Um, so uh, in the interim time, the gas line came in. Um, I believe it's marked on the site plan. You can see, I, I, I believe, I hope, I hope it's there. I thought I'd said it. Um, but on the site plan, there should be the indication of where the, uh, where the gas line came in. It, it no longer affected this area. So the desire came to uh, remove the shed. And that's what Michael was referring to before was um, that uh, were we going to knock that shed down? And I'm happy to knock that shed down. I just thought maybe it should be on a on a uh, on a separate piece since the elevation will certainly change there. Okay. Um, but yeah, we wanted to uh, so that that most of this area that you see of this building, half of it, uh, a little more than half of it was was the old uh, propane shed area, and uh, I need I would like to turn it back into uh, our, our bottle room and then with the door. Uh, which you can see on the propeller, the elevation, uh, would allow us to get in and out of a secured fence area where they pick up the bottles and, and kegs. Um, we, we have a lot of problems since it's no longer contiguous and that area is not really secure. Uh, people steal the kegs from us and I, I guess they return them and sell them. And I, I, I assume that's what they do with them. They steal the bottles and kegs. Um, I don't see the um, gas one. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, oh, I meant on the site plan. I, I, and I believe it's there. I hope. I hope now that I've said it, it is. I don't think I got that. This we got. This wasn't current. The, yeah, this we was got this when we were right. back in January. Right. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So it is um, on the plan here. You can see that they came in a completely different way, as opposed to the way they were going to come in, which would have which would have required us to go through the shed. They came in a completely different, different so they, way. they went through the parking lot? They went through the parking lot instead of through the back yeah. piece, which, you know, it, it was better for me, mm -hmm. actually, in, in the end, so, um, which, you know, gave rise to being able to do this. But uh, we had to, we cleared all the propane tanks out in anticipation of all that, and uh, we, we created this area that, that needs to, at the very least, needed to be, um, 
regraded, uh, you know, once they took all that stuff out of there, they created a, a whole ground. Um, yeah, okay. and we get a lot of <coughs> issues with thievery from the from the shed area. It's, it's really tough to control, you know, and I think they get like $35 a pop for those things and the kids steal them. Okay, so that's the background. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. sure. Um, so what you want to do now <coughs> is you want to, so what you have is you have an open structure with a roof over it. Right. And yeah. you want to, is the roof, I didn't get a chance to get over to the property. Um, is the roof currently extended all the way to the building? Yes, it, it, the roof is exactly as uh, okay, you see the... You picked it down on the south. Yep, ex everything's the same except that it's open on the face out okay. into here. So right now it would be more like an open pavilion. Right. And, you know, I mean, if worst came to worst, that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if it simply stayed as that. Um, right. So you want to close off the... Yeah. You want to close off the north side and Correct. the east the side, I guess. Correct. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. It, it, I'm also trying to... Uh, sort of correct the problem that I made years ago when we first uh, had the we were first deciding the actual footprint of the building um, it was right when the uh, smoking ordinance was about to come in I think it was about a year away they were or it was already clear that New York State was going to not allow that in bars anymore and um, we put a relative rather than build building there we decided we would just enclose this entire space off as uh, you know the uh, we call, they call it in the liquor parlance they call it a controlled area, controlled outside area. So um, at the time it seemed like a good idea. What ended up happening though is it was just way too large. That area itself is is very large, and it, it created a situation where it's very difficult for us to control that area when uh, the bar is in operation. It gets very noisy. It gets very loud. It's just too many people are outside. And you know, even though it's they're allowed to be out there with liquor and in, in, in that space, it's not exactly the easiest thing in the world to control. You know, there's a lot of people outside. They're smoking. There's not really, you know, the only people who are going out there are the security staff to do their sweeps to collect um, bottles and stuff. And um, you know, I do have this ulterior motive that I would definitely like there to be less outdoor space out there. Mm -hmm. It's it's problematic. It gets very noisy sometimes. Um, I, we haven't had many complaints, but when the complaints come from the neighbors, it, they're usually they're usually right. It's usually because, and, and you know, we're, as I said, we're inside, the music's playing, the doormen are really concentrating on that area, uh, on the interior, and you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, to the neighbors who sometimes say the kids outside get rowdy, and, and uh, you know, I, I do have this ulterior mode. I would like that area to not be uh, outdoor smoking area anymore. And also, you know, as a side note, there's just less people smoking, which is a good thing. Um, well, yeah, that brings me to the, the question of um, what area, if any, uh, would you have for a, a smoking, outdoor smoking area? Well, originally this entire area you see here was either the smoking, uh, so. Um, I know it was, oh. but I mean, if you, you're not gonna, just going to reduce it by that by that yeah by that portion. Uh -huh. I'm going to leave it there and reduce it by that much. I'm, I'm I'd like there to be a lot less people out there. He says that Bobby the vestibule, which is now yeah. <coughs> looks to be. I, don't know, the are exactly. I think it's interior. It's 14 by 11, 140 square feet. Let's call it 150 feet, four square feet. Yeah, so why so large? Well, mostly because I need to get to this spot, but I assume what I'll do with that area is I will, uh, you know, I'll move whatever the pool table in there or the oh, video okay. games or something. I'll move it into that area. I'll move something into that area, the ATM. I'll make it more like the area. Yeah, I mean. So, so you intend to? Ex okay. So yeah, I mean, certainly it's going to be indoor, when indoor space and. So the heated space. Yeah, yeah, I would like to heat the. I would like to make it indoor space. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's indoor space, but it's in, but it's separated from the main bar by a door. Yes. And, yes. And, um, yeah. I. I. I it, it certainly would. Be, the liquor authority will certainly consider it a place where people could theoretically be in there drinking. That's you know. I. I right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Um, so yeah, in that sense, the bar would be 140. One or whatever that 154 square feet larger. Not that that's a very big area, but it, it, it would be. And I'll certainly use that space for something like the ATM, the video game, the pool table. Something. Yeah. I, I would just let it be empty space. I don't want people hanging out in it either. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. 
Yeah, no, I'll do something with it. That's probably the pool table is the best thing. I could put it in there. It's a large thing and get people out of that area. Mm -hmm. That's probably what I would do with it. Although I, I must admit, I don't actually have plans for it because, um, you know, I, I don't, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. And so, sure. but yeah, it would be a fully heated functional space of the bar. <clears throat> yeah, go. This the sorting. Yeah. And the testing. Yeah. They're linked by a door. Yes, there would be a, a yeah. yeah. Okay. And if someone's in the vestibule, they can exit in case of a fire or emergency out through the bottle sorting. No, area. no, they couldn't. They would have to go out through the, the where it says closer to the building, new door as selected by owner. Um, I, 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 putting it, I mean, I mean, I, I guess if it was important, it could be, but no, it was not intended to be an exit out of the bar. Because, because if they even if they went through that right. into the, so, and then they got out the next door, they'd be in a locked pen. Yeah. They'd be in the, in the area where the kegs and stuff are. So no, that really would not be a, a suitable emergency exit. But you have, a, you have a door out of the... Yes, right, there's a door right there. Yeah, 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 yeah there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue, there's two doors, which door do I pick? Door A or B. Oh, I, it, it would be a non, it wouldn't be a door that would be in any way look like, you know, it'd be a solid door. It wouldn't, it would not look like an exit in any way, shape or form. I mean, it's basically for us, it, really what all that room is done is we, as the night goes on, all of the empties are put into there. And then each individual um, beer distributor, or liquor distributor needs to have their bottles sorted into their boxes. Sure. So then they're sorted in there and at the end of the night, they're all put out into the pen the next morning, they they pull up, and then they would open that pen up. They take their kegs and stuff, and then they leave their little receipt for us. Yeah. I, I'm just yeah. I wasn't changing the exit at all for the for the uh, existing uh, exterior smoking area. It'd still be the emergency exit. Would still be where it is. It's also a handicapped accessible exit. We all, we put that in uh, when we first built it. We made it a ramp there, um, and all of that would stay the same. Anybody else specific questions? So when you switch to this, you're gonna the <coughs> temporary bottle shed you've been using. You'll just abandon that at this point. Yeah, I'd like to tear it down. Right, I realize. Yes, it's but I'd stop meantime. using it. I would stop using it the minute this one was there. Mm -hmm. We would remove everything out of it. We'd seal it off, and uh, then I'd like to come back and, and do a full site plan for yeah. that piece because I want to tear that down. And, and as I said, the engineers strongly indicated the grades gonna have to change there, which I'm sure you're gonna wanna. Right, I mean, one of the issues in this area is the parking lot, which is somewhat chaotic, so at yeah. least it looks that way. Sure. Um, so there was a conversation, I think the building inspector mentioned the possibility of <coughs> presenting, and I think it makes more sense for when you come back with that part of the site plan. If you could come back with a, an indication of where the like, strike parking spaces would be, um, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I intended to put that on the existing plan, and I believe she's she's put it, uh, the engineer, I'm sorry, is putting that together. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not so relevant for this, because what you're doing here is closing up something that already has an existing footprint. Yeah, and I indicated with Bryant that I wanted to, uh, I want to read it. One of the issues that we have is the garbage dumpster. Um, is a constant source of problem. It really hadn't been before the last two years, before right. the neighbor at 60 Main Street, um, he never really had a place to throw his garbage and it was always a problem. And uh, we, he finally, we finally negotiated where he could use that and now it's just too much garbage in there. It used to be they could miss one, or miss a day if a car was in the way and the, right, the guy couldn't pick it up. It was never an issue. Now, if they ever miss even a day, it's just overflowing with garbage. Right, so right. I'd like to redesign the, the garbage shed over there and I've certainly put that on the exact same application to knock down the bottle shed. We'll make that one and two. Okay. Um, because the, uh, it's not working. It's not really tenable at this time. And there's a few other, there are a few options. There's uh, space in between two of the sheds mm -hmm. that are there, the two garages that are there, that there's a few places it could possibly go. And it's it's more about where the garbage people are comfortable with it going. They have to be able to get the truck in in a particular way. Okay. Um, so um, I have a, you know, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed by the amount of times that uh, it doesn't get picked up and then it's just overflowing. And, you know, I know that's really been on the 60 Main Street guy. He's the one who suffered all of the, the, uh, the, the 
and, you know, the, the wrath of the building department for mm -hmm. it. Um, but ultimately, it's on my property, and even though it's his responsibility to deal with that, okay. you know, ultimately, it's not. All right, oh so my God, it's got to look you guys in the eye. So this is a pretty limited site plan amendment. We can deal with all those issues when you're ready to come back with those. So, um, Michael, on that, on that point, is yeah. there, Bobby, is there any other um, things that we might want to think about that are on the horizon for the property that might affect what you're proposing here? That whether or not they affect the immediate decision, but they might be on our mind and moving forward. With Are you referring to the what I spoke to Michael about, or is it you just this is a just out of no, the question? No, it just sounds like there's a you were saying you're going to be returning with another site plan for a couple other things. Just want to make sure that everything we're looking at now is something we can opine on now and then. Okay, yeah. So uh, the only other thing that I want to do. Um, and I have no idea. Um, right now, the engineers are looking at it. I have no idea. If, do you have the, if you have the site plan? I, all right, so I, I, I briefly spoke with Michael about this. I said I wanted to put in an application in the future to talk about the possibility of putting a building on stilts over the uh, area that borders the laundromat, which is where the existing garbage dumpster is now. The wooden, you guys on here is listed as the wooden refuse container. So. I, I would like to do that, but I don't know if it's, I have no idea whether it meets zoning, density, there's all these issues, I, get, I mean, so yeah, that is something I'm gonna do, but it would certainly, certainly be a much bigger application process for that, possibly even requiring ZBA, so I don't okay. But uh, in terms of that, in terms of anything else, no, just the removal of the, uh, well, um, on this, it already, where it says propane tank, we're in between the, which says two-story brick building, and the 60 Main Street cutout, where it says Deedwanya property, that's already been removed because the gas line's in. Mm -hmm. And then you see the area just to the right of it is the, uh, I'll call it the temporary bottle shed. I mean, it, in the mm -hmm. beginning, it didn't even have a roof on it. Okay. Um, you know, we put a roof over it, probably wasn't legal when we did it, but we did it in a way to stop kids from going over the top and stealing the stuff. But um, as I said, I think that is really what's causing the water to come off, shed, it sheds off into it, it's shedding into the area. Um, you know, I, I, it, it was just sort of one thing that snowballed into the next, into the next, and now we're stuck with this erosion in the alleyway in between the, the 58 and 60 Main Street buildings. So is there any reason, once this is completed, <clears throat> that you couldn't take that shed down? No, I could do it right away. Okay, so... Uh, well, I, as soon as the, the pen was built, yeah. But yeah. As soon as you get a demolition permit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right, so... Yeah, no, it could come down immediately. Certainly, the roof could come off of it immediately. Yeah, I'm just thinking that might. Yeah, I mean, they maybe at least maybe until the, you get the drainage done. Yeah, certainly, it might yeah. alleviate some of the. Yeah, that would be great. If I, I would like to do that part immediately, and then we could certainly okay. visit the whole thing. Maybe that could even be included on. Yeah, you know, on can talk to the business, Yeah, I'd like to be able to take the roof off it just to simply stop that from happening. Although right. I, I do have, um, I, you know, I have a plan. I, I met with a. a, a well, he's actually more of a plumber, but he, he's dealing with the engineer. Uh, we're going to actually put drainage along that so it can collect and then end up out into the street, okay. into the into the storm sewer. Because it, 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 it's obviously it's eating away the foundation of my building, so I'm quite uh, eager to get it taken care of. Other thoughts? All right. So what we need to do tonight? I'm sorry. Okay. So what we need to do tonight is uh, determine completeness for this, um, do seeker, and um, set a public hearing for this. Um, so just to reiterate, what we're what Bobby's asking at this point is just to close up the the pavilion that he has created, um, and then change the use of that and restore that to the bottle shed and portion and then the rest would be your new vestibule yes but this pavilion was created with a building permit right it, it is now yes it is now that's correct okay but so it's not originally yeah i started yeah to, i started to build it yeah. the building inspector came over and said look you can't just restore this even though we originally asked you to tear it down he's like look one village board he made it clear the village board and the planning board were two very different you know things, and that the village board had sort of shot from the hip in letting us do that, and right. so we stopped. We put the application in. I met with you guys. You gave me a temporary permit to. That's what we build approved in January. Okay. Yeah. So in January, yeah, you, you it was the temporary order that was not. It's basically a nine-month. 
permission to go ahead and finish this and have this temporary structure there. But to answer the question honestly, yeah, I had started it beforehand thinking that it wouldn't be a problem since we had discussed it with those guys and then he, Brian came over and said, absolutely not, it's gotta be done this way, so we stopped and yeah. proceeded. So. Good. Okay. Um, so, again, just so people are clear, what we're looking to do is to consider approval of closing this pavilion up to restore it to the bottle shed, creating a new enclosed vestibule that sounds like it will actually end up being um, an interior space for yeah, your I think bar. Yeah, you refer it that way. Um, should. And um, otherwise not changing the existing footprint. Um, in addition to that, we might want to, I think we'll talk to the building inspector in the interim and determine whether or not it makes sense to include also as part of this approval the removal of your the roof old, at least. Yeah, at least the roof, if not the entire temporary bottle shed once this one has been completed and you have a CO for that. Um, I, I, I do have a question. Um, the vestibule that will then turn into interior space, um, will that have a bar in it or no. that's just for no, people definitely. to congregate? Yeah, definitely not. And as I said, I would like to fill that space up because I don't want just people hanging out in there. So it occurs to me that we have these things like the video games, the ATM machine, the pool table, like they can fill that space up and avoid doing something where I, there'd be no bar service in there, there'd be no additional bar added to the building. Right. Stay, all the interior aspects of the bar will stay exactly as they are. So it, it, it alters the interior space of the bar, but it doesn't actually alter the space that's currently allowed for people to go and consume they drinks consume. because they can already do that. Yeah. The now. whole area is yeah, already. It's yeah. already legal for right. that purpose. So. Correct. Yeah. But I mean, there's not going to be a separate extent bar. Uh, yeah. There'll be no in service there. in there. There'll be no bar in there. It'll be devoid of. If they carry except. their yeah. stuff in there, that's yeah. okay. Right. But correct, correct. Okay. And yeah. Right. No, okay. But normally, if we added interior space to the building, we'd have to talk about parking because parking is based on the interior space in the building. But this was approved prior to. All we're doing is talking about a couple of walls here. We are. Right. It's always when when they. I just did, want to be clear on yeah, that. When they did the density, they calculated it based on this entire area, and this is this is actually included in our maximum occupancy. We can't just put whatever our occupancy is inside and then also have people outside. We have one occupancy number for the entire space. Okay. See, that that's a fire code yeah, you issue. Don't need to right. play that yours game. is right. the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yours that's a fire code issue. You're talking about parking. Um, oh. Well, it also did come up at the density when we first. Okay. Well, we can uh, review that. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point, and, um, but for purposes of tonight, um, we're, complete. we're good with that. So yeah. I believe we are mm -hmm. complete. Um, I'm going to presume that this is an unlisted action um, under Seeker, so we'll classify it as that. Um, and... Um, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to make the call that we don't have to refer this to county. I know it's, what do you think? It's, I don't think so. I mean, it's close to the county road, but it's the kind of. It, we're not improving any size of the building. Right, we're not changing the size of the building. We're not, okay. So I'm going to claim that this is, we don't need to send it to county and we could set a public hearing for um, 7 p.m. on Tuesday, August 5th. 2016? August. August. Let's try April. How about April 5th? <laughs> yeah. Wow, what happened to that? Yeah, it's a blip. Yeah, all right, let's try that again. Public hearing for 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 5th, 2016. So moved. Um, Second. Any further discussion? So, completeness, seeker, no referral to county and public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. So um, if we need anything further from you, Bobby, I'm not sure that we will. We'll let you know. There's plenty okay. of time. And if you, if you uh, I'll try to have with me, even though you haven't tested it on me, I, I believe the uh, engineer will have the parking uh, site. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know that we're going to address that at this okay. since we haven't actually, but um, like I said, we may 
consider as part of the approval the removal of the other shed. We'll right. check with the building inspector about and that. And if not, I'll certainly do that in short order. I'll put that in immediately as soon as he gives me the, the, the drawings for it. Um, okay. Because yeah, you yeah, know yeah. that site plan was really just my survey right. redone for this purpose, but I had him redo an actual site plan for the entire parking lot because yeah. I knew we, the questions we're going to talk about the dumpster and the, the temporary lot. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, see, you. You. see you guys. All right. Um, Rich, you'll need to re oh, I, I'm gonna recuse myself. yourself. <coughs> and I mean, this chair is not rolling. <laughs> All right, so uh, PB 1607 um, is a site plan amendment, 58 Elton Avenue. The applicant is one of our own, Rich Steffen, so he's recusing himself and Bill Murray is in his place. Okay, so what we have is, sorry, grab the right one. So we'd approved the construction of a single family home on this property uh, last year and the site plan includes the construction of a um, separate garage in the rear of the property. All we're being asked to consider is um, for wording to be added to the site plan that would indicate that the construction of the garage can be delayed. Um, without a specific period of time listed um, and that assuming that all other conditions of the site plan have been met to the approval of the building inspector that a CO could then be issued. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So that's what we're being asked to do but given the situation with our planning board and the code at this time as with uh, the previous one tonight we are need to set a public hearing go through that process uh, before we can consider approval of this so we have a, a letter from the applicant we have the um, uh, Xerox and the amended plan and we have the application um, so the order of business tonight again is just to determine it's complete, do seeker, and set a public hearing. Um, okay, it's pretty complicated. Any questions, <laughs> any comments? Uh, this is more of uh, helping me yeah. learn up the curve, but is there uh, an open-ended timeline like this? Is there typically any requirements we make of an applicant to share their plan and or likely timeline on something In terms like of this? when when they might build a... Yeah. Let's ask. Put a timeline on it. But 18 months would be probably. Okay. I want to redesign the garage that was there. And I want to take advantage of the lower interest rates that are being offered on mortgages now. Mm -hmm. I can't get a CO with an open site plan. 
Right. So I have two choices to build an ugly garage and get a cheap mortgage rate, or remove it from the site plan and get a cheaper mortgage rate and then build the garage. Okay, so 18 months is a. <coughs> 18 months is, is more than enough. Okay. All right, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I agree. I happened to have a conversation with yeah, someone today that, that said that there's an eight year old, old site plan open in the village, and I, and, uh, I said, oh, let me start asking that question. So, thanks, Rich. Okay. All right, so other comments, thoughts? Um, okay, so in, in terms of completeness, then, I think that we have everything. Um, <coughs> At this point, since literally all we're doing is changing a note on the plan, um, I don't think that we need to, and the, and the site plan itself has things like topo and so forth on it. I don't think that we need to address any of those issues in terms of waivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, seeker, this is a type two action. So no further conversations about seeker are needed. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we consider this application complete, um, that um, on the actual site that we'll need a copy of a site plan that we can, um, I'm assuming, Christina, that we can take the existing site plan that I've signed and then I can um, indicate an additional signature and date for the amendment to it? Is that a reasonable thing or do we need a new copy? I guess, I mean, would you give us, is this your full site plan that I have yes. in Yeah, it is. It's obviously oh. a, a reduced size copy of it. Um, okay, so you're saying you want to, you want the old one as well as the one with the note? No, all I'm saying is oh, that sorry. when the time comes, we'll use the original site plan that was approved last year and we'll go ahead and um, add a signature box to that or a place for me to sign indicating. So <coughs> what we need to do is we need the original site plan for next meeting, okay. the actual one that was signed, so that we can make the note change on that. Oh, okay. These, now, are, these are not official. We have that downstairs. You don't? We couldn't find it. Why not? <laughs> it's kind of a rhetorical question. What's that? Uh, oh, well. I don't know if it ever got back to the offices. Then it would be with me, because I have all of his boxes. So, okay, let me make a note about that. We looked in the file, we could find the amendment, we could find everything else. That's why we use that reduced copy. I see. Okay. So let me. Um, we even looked in the files in front and back in case I missed file. Do you remember what the number was at the time? I don't remember what I had to do. <laughs> I didn't ask you that. All right, I'll check it out. Um, all right, so we need the original site plan. Okay. No, it was approved by the, by the notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll look for that. Thanks. Um, okay, so termination is complete. Seeker's done. I'd like to make a motion that this application is complete um, and that we set a public hearing for. Um, Roughly 7.15 on Tuesday, April 5th, 2016, or as soon as a uh, slot becomes available. So moves. Second. Second. Who seconds? Bill Gus. Sudo. Bill. Oh, Bill Murray. Sorry. Okay. Um, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're good for that. And... It for applications for this evening. Um, you all can return to your normal positions.
All right. <laughs> All right. So. Did you read that email to <laughs> Public menace. Yeah. Public hearing should be great. I look thinner in, in darker colors. So I'm told. All right. Um, so our planner, Dave Gilmore, is um, homesick tonight. And so that's why he's not with us here at the meeting. Um, but we should. So we received from him um, a memo dated March 8th that, um, at our request, provides a, a little bit of background. Um, was this helpful for people in terms of what you were looking for, in terms of annotations about the code? Um, Michael, the one thing I would add is that I think through just dialogue, I understood that there were some instances where the existing fee policy was adversely affecting certain types of development or construction. And maybe it would be helpful just on the record to comment on a couple of examples of that or one example of that where that prompted this kind of a, a review. Is that helpful? Sure, except I don't have any examples. Okay. I mean, if other people do. Uh, for example, I understood that uh, if calculated according to the existing code or the existing policy, Woodland Ponds um, fees would have been some astronomical amount relative to the cost of the development versus that of a <coughs> typical mm -hmm. residential home. And then net zero is also. Yeah, there was this question of like, why are we doing this? And, and I right. thought I remembered that that's why we're doing it, that there was this like sort of maybe proportionate, but maybe unfair impact of the existing fee policy. Um, but I don't, I don't not, need to protract the conversation. No, no, that's important. fine. Um, I'm. I'm not sure if that is the reason. I don't actually think that I can address that. Okay. Um, this was something that was initiated by um, by Maurice, um, and I don't. It didn't get too far. I don't know if you have any specifics. So, well, a lot of our discussions were around the idea of affordable fees yeah. and affordability, and that you know, to build a studio apartment and charge a developer $7,500 in fees just for the uh, recreational value. I mean, it adds, we've never got a quick calculator, but 48 apartments at the new net zero would come it's in roughly over. a quarter of a million. Right. I don't know if it's the 7500 or 5000 I remember that was the impetus for even but looking at this. this. Or somebody, you know, somebody. These changes don't address that. I think that's kind of why I'm saying. So, um, but let me let me clarify another point, at least is the that's way I understand. That's these changes don't go far enough. Um, <clears throat> since you mentioned Woodland Pond as, as an example, the, I mean, as I understand it, the, these recreation impact fees, which are allowed under New York State law, it is that it, it recognizes that as you build housing, you are bringing new people into the community, some of whom will have kids and want certain kinds of recreational amenities. Others will be people who are, you know, adults who want other kinds of recreational amenities. And that um, <clears throat> in order to avoid having to impose taxes on people who are already living there, who are using these, there's this <coughs> sense that New, you, new people in the community who are increasing the recreational burden and so by charging an impact fee for this new housing, you're helping to offset the cost. Alternatively, if those new developments um, or new housing units can provide recreation on site or access to recreation, on their property, um, then you don't need to provide a, f you don't need to charge a fee. And I was always of the opinion, the way I read our code, is that there was actually an order in which you would first uh, ascertain whether or not there was land that was suitable for recreation that would service people at that, um, at, at this new development, let's say. Um, and 
absent that, you would then ask for a fee in order to put it into a dedicated fund that could then be used to purchase new land for recreation or improve existing recreational facilities. Um, I, I have the feeling that both in the town and the village over the years, people have seen it more as a, as a way to get money in order to do this as opposed to looking at it sort of sequentially where you look to see. And, and it could be that, I, that this is just how I read it. Um, in the case of Woodland Pond, they did make a substantial um, commitment to uh, put a conservation easement on 35 acres of their property, of uh, which a big portion of that is to the rear of the property and contiguous with what at the time was a fairly new concept of creating this Millbrook Preserve. Um, there was also a certain degree of recognition that they would revisit the issue of making that land publicly accessible when it was appropriate to do so. It's not currently publicly accessible. It is accessible to residents. Um, and in that regard, it sort of does meet Woodland Pond's recreational commitment to providing something on site for, for their residents. In fact, they have other things as well, but, um, but from the purposes of sort of the bigger community, that making that land forever wild was a, was a substantial uh, part of the agreement. And, I, you know, and now I think that the Millbrook Preserve is um, sort of a real entity and there's, um, organ, you know, there's a kind of a foundation of, of people working to try to create that and, and secure all of the details. Um, I think it's probably an appropriate time to, to, to be talking again to them. Um, anyway, that's a specific example. Um, I have some questions. Um, do we do we currently have an account into which this money has been? Absolutely. Made? Yeah, we've had it for decades. Okay. And is it being used currently to provide? I don't know what the status of it is. When I was on the village board, I did my best to use it. Okay. Um, I used it to make improvements in Hasbrook Park. I, I, was, I got the board to agree to funds to put in water fountains, because there weren't any, um, to do other, um, I forget some of the other specific improvements that we used money for in that park. Um, I, I believe, I hope, that some of the money was used to put in the playground at Moriello, uh, since the village made up, would have made a 50% contribution to that. I don't, I wasn't, I don't know the specifics about that. Um, My so. next question is, um, is, is everyone who comes in who fits within these rules assess that money? Or are there people who are excused from contributing to that fund? Nobody has the right to be excused. Okay. Um, but in the past, I'm just, I'm just trying to see if it's equitably applied. Well, it it has not been equitably applied because the planning board has not consistently done its due diligence, and so there are numerous examples of of um, developments and smaller subdivisions in which um, this wasn't exercised, and the plans were approved, and then the planning board or the village board went back and tried to get the money. But they had they were the party who had not handled it properly and there wasn't really any recourse. So. Okay. Is does that give grounds for any new applicant to say, I'm not paying because he didn't pay? Uh, legal opinion says no. Not so. Okay. How can we ensure that this is equitably applied to everyone who qualifies under this and comes before <coughs> us? Uh, we need to I, I would say, um, and then other people can answer, yeah, is that we need to make this a, a part of the conversation at the beginning of a, an application where it's appropriate, mm -hmm. that our secretary needs to take note of it, um, and that as part of the checklist of things that has to happen before we approve, she says to us, oh, don't forget, recreation fees have to be paid 
before, um, you know, and so as part of the resolution for approval, that could be a specific <coughs> component. I would actually go a step further and say, we're not even gonna vote on approval of a project until those have actually been paid, because because I, they can be very substantial. Yeah, and, and, and I could see where someone would say, okay, I've gotten my approval, I didn't pay it. Right. Done, gone. Yeah, well, getting an approval here is not the same thing. The approval happens when the signature goes on the right. site plan or the plot or whatever, but I still feel that um, I would I would discourage us from voting until we've actually gotten. Because I, I would want to make sure that if we're going to continue to do this, that it's applied in a fashion that applies to everyone who appropriately qualifies under these guidelines and that we make certain that it's done so that it becomes part of the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the regular process and so that people come to expect that that will right. occur and that if there are any exceptions to that, how is that going to be decided? For instance, I mean, do we do we look at some place like the net zero and say quarter million dollars? Well, okay, so that raises the issue of what the fee should be. Right. Yes, but it also okay. raises the issue of making sure that, that that it's applied correctly to a standard and that it is enforced. Okay, Rich. Historically, it was a fee that was assessed against a piece of property, of raw property. And I argued, even though I paid lots of those fees when I did the Green Acres, when I used to own the Green Acres subdivision, I paid a lot of those fees. Mm -hmm. We paid the fee as the lot came online. So when we went in for a building permit, we paid the fee. We're going to use the lot, here's the recreation fee, black. And I would argue that. I grew up, my recreation was in my backyard. Why can't these kids be in the backyard? You know, I'm providing recreation by providing a backyard, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, it was flawed in that I don't think it should be tied to land. It should be the, tied to who lives on the land. If somebody comes in and wants to convert a three bedroom house to a four bedroom house, aren't they adding to the recreational burden of the town by bringing another bedroom onto the house. I think it really should be on occupancy of the land, not on the raw land itself. We can approve a subdivision that can have two family houses on those lots. Do we charge a double fee if there are two family houses being approved? Or what if it's a lot like the STS lot that's going to have 48 units on it? It's one lot. Are we going to charge them one $7,500 fee? or $250,000 because it's got that many people on it. I think really tying it to how the land is going to be used makes this use fee make sense. And the number, we can talk about what's a fair number. But talking about land paying for recreation is like talking about land as, as if it's going to recreate. The land doesn't recreate. It's how it's being used that will determine the recreation. Um, that's why we don't charge it on commercial. We charge it on residential. And it really depends on how it's going to be used. I, I would think that an apartment complex that's all one-bedroom apartments is a different recreational demand than one that's all three-bedroom apartments and should pay a different fee. Hmm. Well, and then if somebody comes in and has a, a house they want to cut into two apartments, wait a minute, is that a new unit? Is that a new, is that a, a recreational fee because there will now be two sets of people living there? So our code to some extent addresses some of this. Um, right. The fee, uh, the recreational impact fee appears in two different chapters. It appears in the zoning code it also appears in the subdivision code. And your comments about land would really only apply for subdivision applications. Correct. Um, and given that this is the village and it's, um, there are relatively few
few subdivisions going on, um, but also because well, even, well, we got the Niffin, we got the Niffin lands. And okay, but wait. Parcel. But even more importantly, uh, because even single-family homes now come in front of the planning board, the having this under a subdivision may be a, an unnecessary thing to have. Right. Um, right. That, yes. And uh, because. We're gonna get. It. We're gonna see these things. Later. It's a it's a use fee, right? Isn't it? For yeah, use? it is. It's yeah. an impact fee, is how it's described. You could call it a use fee. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the questions that came up, and just from a common sense point of view, I don't understand how the answer can be anything but but the right answer, um, which is this question of if you do do a subdivision and then you build houses, could you charge people twice? And to me, that's nonsensical. Yeah. You can't charge them for doing a subdivision and then charge them again for building the houses on the subdivision. Um, I agree with Rich that it um, should really only be applied when the actual buildings are being built. And, um, but the problem was that previously, there was no way to collect that fee because if a subdivision was approved, then every building that was built was just went in and got a building permit. Well, yeah. The good one is Green Acres used to be my subdivision. Yeah. The one is the net zero now. Right. We did not pay the recreation fees on those lots. I guarantee you I never wrote checks out for a vacant lot. But you did once. For 19 of the homes, I wrote checks out because I put homes on them. So in order to get your... But, to get your but check out how many recreation fees were paid for the new homes that are there now. Building permits don't require a recreation fee. Lots do, and the lots pre-existed. Right. He bought existing lots, ergo, no recreation fees. So how is it that you ended up paying the fees? No lots. For back then? Yeah. Because that's the way we did it back then. When I went in for a building permit, I had to give him a check for the recreation fee. Okay. And I think it was a whopping 1500 bucks at the time. So, okay. So there's a, a lot of different pieces to this. So one piece is if you're going to do a subdivision and you're going to be building homes, what's the appropriate time to to require? Well, no, no, no. I gave you an example of we shouldn't charge it on vacant land. Right. So then we when have the land to, goes into use, I mean, Cafferty's project no, should, have, should have had should have had a uh, a recreation fee based on those other buildings. Right. So the point is that the code doesn't really address this except to the extent that as long as the planning board is going to be doing site plans on each home, then we can collect it at that point. Otherwise, there has to be a way in the code to approve a subdivision but guarantee that payment will happen yeah. at the prior to the issuance of the building permit. But most site plan approvals, Michael's, are not subdivisions. No, I know. I'm saying I'm trying to say there are multiple things. So that's one. The other one is the issue that you're talking about of what happens when you increase density on a right. an mm -hmm. existing lot. Um, and then the third one has to do with things like apartment buildings, which is I think clearly handled under the zoning code already. Um, in that. It, it specifically says housing units, and then the argument becomes, is every housing unit the same as every other housing unit? Right. right. So is a studio the same as a two-bedroom? When I built Huguenot, um, the, the, the affordable housing apartments on North Chestnut Street, mm -hmm. I put in 24 apartments, a zero recreation fee. Because? It's old people don't recreate. Not true anymore. But I'm just telling you, there's, there's, there's the times that, that, that yeah. work. And we were trying to do an affordable project. And the idea was that you can add it to it, but cost plus profit equals rent. Yeah, so the well, cost, I wonder if part of it was that because it was a, it was a, a DH, whatever. It DH, I got the money through DHCR. Yeah, so I wonder if that wasn't part of, that would perhaps create a legitimate exemption. <coughs> or I don't know, because I don't know at the time. Well, okay, but when I did the DHCR loan, it was supposed to be sundown in 20 years, and they returned back to fair market value apartments. Okay. I sold that apartment complex over. The current owner went back to DHCR and renegotiated the tax credits for another 20 years because okay. he's in a tax credit selling business. That's why it's still affordable housing. 
that will sundown in another 14 or 15 years, and it could be affordable housing. Or it could be market rate. It could be market rate. Right. So, I mean, at that point, where are they going to recreate? There ain't, there ain't an ounce. I mean, I put 24 units on an acre there. There ain't an ounce of no, land of available. Up. I mean, I, I also think, and again, other people should chime in. Um, I, I don't want to, I feel like this thing, there's a certain balance. Like, I don't, it seems inane to me to try to capture every single change that happens that increases some density in the village and insist that that result in people forking over money to, um, in order to cover recreation as if we have no resources and no place for people to play. Because neither of those things are true. So, I mean, Mr. Robinson, who was just here, is, you know, clearly intending to add an additional bedroom to his house in order to provide for foster kids who may already be living there, but in right. principle, we're adding a bedroom. Right. It never, um, I don't even think the code actually covers that, thankfully. It doesn't. Um, but, you know, but, our, but would we want to do that? I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to start saying, all right, you're going to add a bedroom, so now you need to give us $5,000. Um, that seems nuts. On the other hand, if somebody's building a, <coughs> you know, a, a number of years ago, there was a some, uh, whatever, an apartment complex that was built. It's 96 apartments. That's a pretty substantial number of additional people. And it's right in the village. And, you know, arguably, there should be, um, if we're going to do this at all, then that seems to me to be a, something where you would ex acknowledge they need to pay recreation fee and, um, you know, and then that money hopefully will get used. So. Okay, so we probably need to break it down into some component parts. And then <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, take a bite off that element at a time. Sure, I think that's a good idea. <coughs> so should we enumerate what those are again? Probably should. All right, I'll write them down. People want to start. <coughs> so Go ahead. we've got new construction, right? Mm-hmm. Then we would have essentially a well. Change. Let's go to the simplest first. Do we do it under the subdivision regs, or do we do it under the? So does it apply to the to, to land, or does it apply to use fee? Is what you're asking. Right. Okay. So that's one thing we got to decide. Okay. And then. Oops, uh, this is open floor. I think it's the, it's the idea of the basis of the fee, whether there's a scale that addresses relativity. In other words, density. If we're encouraging density, is it uh, per unit or is it some sliding scale that addresses the idea that if you can put 48 units on a single piece of land, that should be a very different per unit rate than one where you're building a single family occupancy on a piece of land. Mm -hmm. Because I, I understood that was the reason this question was being raised at the start, but this memo is not at all, or none of the dial, none of the things that. Have been you have to go back and look at the. I, yeah. I didn't do any. Have to do the, research. The, this whole idea yeah. was the disproportionate uh, rate that we were likely to charge to uh, builders that were encouraging density or that were uh, proposing density on the land. Tim has some light to shine. Oh, Tim, sure. I'd be curious what you guys think about this idea. What about um, charging a fee for every CO based on square footage? This way you're encouraging density, and this way it's it's just tied into, you know, so if you add a building, if you add a, 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 an additional uh, room to your house, there's a little fee that then goes into a rec fund. But then wouldn't we need to make allowances if someone Subdivided a house into apartments. It Did went from from a from a two family or from a one family house into an apartment with no, four five, five, five no square bedrooms. footage, no traffic. That's true, but there would be an increase in the density in the number of it's people, usage. and so then that would be a use fee. 
So if they go from having two people in a house to eight people in a house. I'm just thinking just generally square footage as a way to yeah. do this. Possible. As opposed to per unit. Because this way then you deal with the, you know, a, like an NBR, you know, which is what we want, the infill and density versus like a much larger home. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think at the root of this is occupancy, how many people are going to be using the services. So I think we need to circle back to what, how we might address that and how that might be scaled with various uh, <coughs> being proposed. Well, you, could, you, could do that on, you could do that on a bedroom. You could do it because yeah. New York State Building Codes gives you square footage for one bedroom occupancy, two-person occupancy. So we could tie it to the bedroom in, in the code. Which would kind of address the combination of those. Which, you know, tips, tips, again, tips. something like the, the Wartz Avenue project would have been, you know, how would we come up with that fee? Uh, uh, you know. Or John Johnson's down on, on Church Street. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of them where they, you know, multiple bedrooms and single buildings. So if we charge on a square, you know, square footage of a building, but there's Sorry, 20 but occupants in each building. This is sort of open dialogue. The, the issue is that if it's not bedrooms, it, it might not be able to be bedrooms or square foot because it feels like there's more than one dimension. So if you build up on a half an acre, you got lots of bedrooms and lots of square footage. And we're, and, and we're encouraging that type of development in certain districts today, and it might make the fee disproportionate and, and prohibitive to the construction if the fee is just dependent on linearly square footage and or bedrooms. So there, there, there might need to be considered some sort of sliding scale that from zero to 10 bedrooms, it's this per bedroom. From 10 to 30, it's this per bedroom. From 30 to 60. And I don't have an answer, but um, it seems to me like that would address the root of what I thought was uh, this, the root of the, why this conversation was raised, which was that there are certain either past developments or proposed developments that might yield prohibitive fees because of the nature of the way the scale is currently. I guess yeah, you could do something like <coughs> of square feet as a ratio, uh, well, the matrix of square feet and, and occupancy yeah. for bedrooms. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an analog. For well, there's got to be other municipalities that have rec fees that sure. we sure. might be able to uh, take a hint from. Uh, yeah. And and I suspect uh, Dave Gilmore would have uh, yeah. a lot more background on that and could chime in on that, uh, but I'll, you know, obviously not tonight. Is, yeah. uh, is there some sort of history we can look at in terms of how these were assessed? Well, the last big jump was um, just part of Jason leaving office. I think it went from 5,000 to 7,500. Yeah. What was the rationale behind that? It's, it's in, the, in the two different parts of the code. One says 5K and one says 75. So I think it's like 5K in the subdivision piece, 75 in the per unit piece. Yeah, really? that part is odd. Oh, God, they never it's even to, worse. They never used to be different. I don't know how they got disconnected. But um, anyway, um, I mean, when I was looking at this back in the 2000s, um, one of the things I was trying to figure out was how do you, you know, what's the basis for setting the fee? Like, that is, if you're going to use the money to purchase land or purchase equipment. I mean, New York State law, depending on how you read it, I mean, some people said to me that it's really only allowed to use for actual purchase of land. Um, but we didn't do that exclusively. We did capital improvements with this, some of this money. And, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it seems to be okay. So... But the question is like how, so how do you decide? I mean, is $5,000 per new family make sense? Or, I mean, so there's, there's gotta be some way to sort of determine this. Um, the other thing is, um, I mean, to take the NBR as an example, because we can anticipate that's likely to be an area where we'll have a high level of development, high density, and 
um, new projects coming in over the years. So there's a park fairly close to that. I mean, Memorial Park is there. Um, it has a playground, which in itself has a certain amount of controversy around it. Um, the rail trail is there. There are some vacant parcels along um, the NBR district. And so rather than just look at it exclusively in terms of cash that we're just going to sock away, um, why not also consider having a conversation with a developer about making a contribution either through a cash donation or in kind for, say, expanding the uses at Moriello Park or improving the playground there so that it's available to everybody year-round as opposed to just if you're a pool member. Um, you know, or making improvements to the rail trail or establishing some kind of, you know, <clears throat> endowment for the rail trail. So those kinds of things could be done that would get you away from dollars per square footage or dollars per unit or dollars per, per people, but, but just look at it and uh, try to find a way that's equitable without being so um, rigid about it in the same way that we now manage parking? I, I, yeah, I, yes, I understand that, but I think that if, if you are not fairly cut and dried on this, that someone's yeah. going to find a loophole to exploit and then we're going to have trouble. Yeah. Or, or they'll say that it was not fairly applied. Yeah. Yeah. But what, yeah. But yeah. what you're suggesting, Michael, is not unusual in, in larger municipalities or cities. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, where they have problems. You could, you could find a developer that might say, uh, the, let's just say we propose and we say the floor of the amount you'd want, you'd need to contribute for the development you propose is 25000 But we have a, we, we introduced a conversation about a larger contribution that might be a branded contribution or a, you know, uh, a philanthropic contribution that a developer might be very comfortable with, even though it's double the amount of the fee. So if you thought, John, you didn't want people to get over by leaving this open, you say, well, the floor is X, this is the fee, mm -hmm. but we have ideas about a, a, a way that you might endow a piece of property or some other more, more significant contribution. So I don't know if that's, led, if that's something we would want in the, rec in the uh, regulations, but that's the way a lot of these things work. That, that's, a, you know, with a municipality or a city yeah. negotiating with a developer to say, yeah, well, you do this project, but you've got to build a park adjacent. I think we also have to remember that there's not a whole lot of land left in the village to build on. Well, that's not true. We really got to take a look at, you know, the fact that the village really should be infilled much more than it is. I mean, if, you know, I can name five or six different vacant lots that are in this village that you wouldn't. Driving by, you'd say, that's a lot. Well, guess what? Check our zoning, folks. It's a lot. Um, and there are probably five or six and maybe more. And then we come to ones like what happened down in Pencil Hill. Yeah. You know, and then we've got the Niffin project coming on, which is a huge piece of, of land. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, which, which means, I, and I don't think we should tie it to land because it's also not as fluid as tying it to the use on the property. If we pay it once it's a lot, then that's it forever. And we change zoning, what happens? The recreation fee. What if we change a piece of R2 property to R3, where now it can be twice the density that it was before? Yeah. Does the recreation fee say, well, it's already been paid on that lot? You know, that's it. You know, that. Oh, well, he got to buy on that one. Um, I, I don't know. I'm glad I'm at the end of my development career because I can say these things. <laughs> The, well, I, don't, um, I don't think you'd be on the planning board if you were. Oh, that's true. That's true. I probably wouldn't be. <laughs> the, um, so, so land is, is just one of those ones. It's, 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 it doesn't really talk about recreation. Land doesn't talk about recreation. Buildings do. How the building is used. And a two-bedroom, 5,000-square-foot house uses less recreation land than a six-bedroom, 5,000-square-foot house. And probably you would find out that people who have half a million dollar houses don't really need public recreation lands that we're talking about. 
Probably don't use them. That's not our problem, though. Huh? That's not our problem, though. No. You can't discern that by... The no, but that's what I'm saying. To, to try to t tie it to something like square footage yeah. would be difficult. I think the original... It ties the, it to wealth. The, the, the takeaway that was, what are the dimensions we need to think about that would make this plan... Mm -hmm. uh, Generate the, that would that would generate the funds we're looking for, but also make it equitable and sliding in some form or another, and and not discourage density in places where we want to discourage density. I think I think there's a lot to think about on this if it's really a priority of the planning board and the or the village. And I think this memo is. I didn't really. I thought the the conversation was about the things we're describing now. But, yeah. But the memo is just like semantics. Relative yeah. to, to what we're talking about. No, I agree. Yeah. I, I, and so how, do we, how do we want to approach this? And kind of delineate the things we want to talk about or think about. So what do we do? Do we uh, get Dave involved? Do we you know, form kind of a subcommittee to hammer it out? Um, how do you want to approach it? Um, well, it'd be kind of nice to have an idea how the village board thought about the idea of changing those. Or did he just see that the seventy-five hundred dollars? I mean, there's a reason for the seventy-five hundred dollars fee. It must be. What was the rationale for that? Or just Jason made that number up? Well, you want me to remember? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember dinner before, so I don't want you to remember. No. Uh, I, I I thought that the fee when I first came here, I thought the fee was even lower than five, but it was three. It used to be three, yeah. It used, it used to, to be. be three. Yeah. yeah. So what? So in eight years. Or less, it more than went from three to five to seven five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two and a half times. I wasn't on the board at that time. Tell me, yeah. why did that happen? I don't know. The cost of recreation went up two and a half times. Yeah, making up for all the fees that were never collected. <laughs> that may be it too. Um, do we, at, just as a sidebar, do we actually know how much money we have currently in the? Fund? Okay. Easy enough to find out. Well, well, I don't think it should matter. Well, no, it's just kind of a curiosity. No, it's a curiosity. Okay. Yeah. No, it doesn't, I don't think that plays into our conversation very yeah. much. Yeah. And I can tell you it's not going to be an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. um, well, the last large scale apartment complex that came online paid a reduced fee. And that was a negotiated In a uh, manner Victoria of speaking, Square. yes, they paid a reduced fee. And that would, would have been like a it was not negotiated. discretionary? No. Nope. It wasn't negotiated? No. Nope. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I know of it on the record. Um, it was, as I understand it, I don't remember what the fee per unit was. Um, there were 96 units, I think. I'm going to say it was 3000 per unit at that time. Um, the site plan was approved. That project went through an environmental impact statement, a variety of things. Um, there are old wetlands on the property, so there was a lot of discussion about Army Corps of Engineers and other things. And um, one of the things the applicant agreed to do was to restore some existing wetlands on site, restore some existing wetlands off site, to put a trail through, I believe, the wetlands here that would serve as uh, passive recreation. I don't know to what extent any of those things have been done. I've never, I haven't gone back to follow up on that. Um, and then they were going to pay a fee per unit. And I don't think that was reduced at all below the, whatever, the 3,000. However, they didn't pay anything before they got their site plan approval. Um, and uh, building permits were issued. Um, and the applicant came in. I think the building permits had started. I may be wrong about the sequence. But anyway, the applicant came in, paid one fee, wrote on the back of the check that, or on the bottom of the check on the memo that he was paying this under duress. And then subsequently refused to pay any more. But it didn't halt the project. And then <laughs> when the village board went back and tried to get the money at a future date, the argument from the builder's attorney was that that the planning board had not 
gone ahead and you know done their part, which was withhold approval until they collected the fees. So lesson learned. So I don't know no, if I have that 100% accurate, but it's pretty. I do know some of that Thank personally. You. So anyway, so no, we didn't get much from that. It's been a mess for years, Michael. It wasn't just that project. Oh, I know. It's been a mess for years. Like I said, back to when I was doing that one in the late 80s. And, you know, it was kind of like, hey, what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, but if we're going to charge recreation fees, let's, let's come up with some sort of a, a rationale for it that, you know, it doesn't tie it to land you. It ties it to when the land actually gets used by people. Okay. Vac vacant land is just not a good way to do it. So, um, so John asked this question about whether or not we want to, how do we want to proceed with this? Um, before we answer that, you haven't said very much. Do you want to have anything that you want to say at this point? Nope. Okay. And Bill? Was, was there any discussion in the establishment of this fee, some sort of percentage of the finished project? I don't think so. Or 2%? For a specific app yeah, to, to, to come up with some sort of You mean for a specific application? Right. No, I think it's generally just been either uh, the, the gifting of some kind of land, setting aside of a certain amount of land for residents in there, or um, in lieu of that, pay, payment based on whatever the, the fee is at the time that your application is approved. So. Um, There are towns that, I, that I've worked in over the years that just assume that the developers giving land it must be wetlands, and don't take and don't take land in lieu. We do take land in lieu, um, but the problem is is that the, the fee schedule has just not been adhered to. Okay, so all right, so what I so what I'm hearing is that. We, we have a lot of ideas and certainly no consensus about on what the basis would be for tying a, any particular fee to. Um, well, I, I like the, I'm sorry, I like the idea of, of applying it to use, the type of use, but like the example that was just given, how do you make sure that you can enforce collection? You know, what can you hold on, on what's hold the CEO? Yeah. Can't get the building permit. Or you just don't even, you don't give approval at the planning board level. If it's a site plan, you can do it at that point. Yeah, but, yeah, and then you can run into the 96 apartment problem. We don't want to police it. Okay. We don't want to, I don't want to police it as a planning board member. I think the best way to police it is put it at the fee level where we're all most used to paying fees, and that's our friendly building inspector. And, it's, and it becomes part of the fee for getting your building. I'm going to build a three-bedroom house. A three-bedroom house is a recreation fee of this. I'm going to build a two-bedroom apartment. A two-bedroom apartment has a recreation fee of this. I'm going to build 18 one-bedroom apartments. A one-bedroom apartment has a recreation fee of this. And it's a pretty simple. You know, doesn't take much to calculate it. Now, can we come back and negotiate it? I, you know, I'd like to see us have that ability. So that if somebody came in and with an affordable housing, or we could turn to somebody like Net Zero and say, okay, look, at, on the percentage of your apartments where you're doing affordable rents, we can give you this break on the recreation fee because we agree that we support affordable housing in your efforts to you know, promote them. Um, so I'd like to have some sort of room to wiggle in there. But I think if we tie it to the, the fee that's the easiest to monitor, that's the building permit. That says what's going on in the land. If somebody comes in and wants to convert a one bedroom to a two bedroom, or a one apartment to two apartments, it's a new unit. We don't charge them for the original unit, but it's a new unit going in. So it's 
So Michael, why, while I don't disagree with some of the suggestions that are being shared, I think where you left it was like, what process do we want to go through to nail down a recommendation on this? Yeah. I think that's, that's a, that would be a good way to, I mean, this is a, it feels like there's a lot of, there's a complexity and some dimensions to the conversation. I feel like it'd be great to agree to that. Um, because I think there's enough ideas here that we could gel into a, pro, into a determination pretty quickly. I agree, there's a lot of good ideas here. So how would you all, I mean, I, I, what I can do to the extent that it's of value is I can go back and look at um, the files that I have from Maurice and see if I can ascertain some of the basis for why this came up last summer. Um, but, I, but that may be helpful, but in addition, I think we're sort of moving in our own direction at this point or whatever. Um, maybe it's consistent with what he had in mind, uh, but I think what we're doing here is probably important regardless of whatever the motivation was that brought it here. Um, you know, Mike, when we did the MBR changes, we yes, sir. part village board, part planning board, why don't we bring the village board in on this right from day one? And You're suggesting a subcommittee? Of some yes, sort? I am suggesting a subcommittee, similar to like when we did the MBR district. Okay. And then the subcommittee kind of hashed out something we brought to the planning board. The planning board approved it, passed it on to the village board. The village board adopted it. But um, I think that's a good idea. How does everybody else feel? What is our liaison thing? I think it's a good idea. Um, that you could do with then two and two, two members of the planning board, two members the village board. of the village board. Therefore, we don't have a quorum to worry about. Yep. And uh, meetings could take place. <coughs> I think uh, pretty uh, quickly. Right. I'd like to. I'd like to. My only caveat is I'd like to um, encourage us to continue this conversation and get a little more. <coughs> be able to give this subcommittee some specific objectives, as opposed to just handing the problem over and saying, "Here, you figure it out." I mean, I know it includes would include two of us and, and probably at least one of you, um, but or maybe not. But uh, but I I think since I mean I my feeling is that we've we've raised a number of issues here and some possible solutions, if you will, or or ways to do this that people feel are, is equitable or whatever uh, and. I'm wondering if there's a way to sort of generate a document that kind of summarizes what we're talking about here um, that we could then all sort of mull over and expand on. Uh, if it's in comments to me, I could put them in a document and send them out to everybody. All right, and you have, are you, have you been taking some notes based on this? Okay, um, and I have some. So, okay, let um, okay, So step one is to get the comments to her, come back, have a discussion about it, then look at, at uh, some objectives, and then, then create something with the, the village board. Yeah, I, th I think what I'd like to be able to do is solution. establish what, if there is, if you want to put it in a certain framework, let, let's establish what the problem is or problems, mm -hmm. and then um, different ways of possibly approaching it in order to solve those problems. And maybe that's enough information to then pass yeah. to a subcommittee. So, okay. Well, thanks. I think that was great. Um, so if we're done with that, then uh, I'd like to move to uh, approval of the minutes from March 1st, 2016. So moved. Second. John Litton and Rich Steffens on the second. Um, is everybody here? Everybody's here. Everybody was here. All right. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. So, um, meeting overview, um, very quickly. We have an extra week but for our next meeting. Uh, meeting's April 5th, 
So we've, al we've allowed um, for applicants to submit materials up through close of business next Tuesday, the 22nd, right? At least that's what we've done with net zero. Oh, for ongoing applications. For ongoing applications. Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we postpone our agenda setting meeting for April 5th until a week from tomorrow so that we know what we have in. Um, you're on. If you I'm want, on. If you want to join us. So that would be March 23rd at 1.30. Um, at this point, we are expecting to have um, our second conversation with the Net Zero LLC. We have two public hearings scheduled. Uh, we'll come back and discuss the recreation fee policy. I don't know of anything else. There, there was something from uh, Roddy Serta, but I don't know that he came in and signed his application. He wanted to do something with Napa Auto Parts okay. that's vacant and change it to auto sales, but I don't know that he... Well, if it, it, today was the last day. So he hasn't submitted anything. Um, at the time I left the office, he had not. Okay, so we'll find out about that. Um, and nothing back from the Discovery Institute subdivision? No. Okay. All right, so that's it. That's it. Uh, um, anything else? No? All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. Me, I always do. Jesus. <laughs> Second. All right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Thank you all. It's a bunch of nice guys. Well, applications are different too. Yeah, they really, really are. It's radically different like stuff. An hour and 20 minutes probably curious. <laughs> what have us pushing 10 o'clock. I'll be interested in Yeah. Turn your mics off if they're not, right?